Welcome to The Stateless Atheist, where religion, politics, and society collide. This is going to be the first video for a series that I like to call The Stateless Atheist Commentaries, or SAC for short. In this series, I will be discussing a topic, sometimes broad and other times narrowly focused. For this first one, I will be discussing why I care and why you should also care what other people believe. Well, let's get started. I wanted to start analyzing more in-depth topics on religion, but now I think I need to start much more fundamental. Many people have asked me, why do I care what others believe? They make the claim that as a libertarian and an anarchist, I should only worry about people's actions, not their beliefs. I disagree completely. Belief precedes action, and in order to change people's behavior, we need to change their beliefs. However, as a libertarian anarchist, I only believe in violence for defensive purposes. But this has nothing about aiming to change people's behavior in other ways. Some methods include debate, education, and if necessary, rallies, boycotts, and protests. This channel is hoping to do exactly that, change people's behavior through education. If I fail at that, I hope, at least, I open you up to unfamiliar ideas. With this video, I will explain in depth why I care what others believe and why you should care also. In the first section, I'm going to speak generally about belief and causation. In the second section, I'm going to analyze authority some. Then in the final section, I'm going to talk specifically about religious belief. Here, I will mostly be talking about the Abrahamic religions, but it will have some applicability to other religions as well. If you don't know what an Abrahamic religion is, it includes all the various sects of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These three religions share a lot in common with each other. They all believe in a personal, monotheistic God, they share a lot of the same history, and all stem from Abraham, hence why they are all called the Abrahamic religions. Non-Abrahamic religions, on the other hand, are quite different and varied. There are polytheist religions like Hinduism and Japanese Shinto. There are pantheistic religions like some forms of paganism and Wiccan. And there are even atheistic religions like Buddhism. Some religions even straddle multiple lines like Hinduism, which is both polytheistic and pantheistic. However, I am, as I already stated, mostly concerned with the Abrahamic religions because, first, that Christianity and Islam are the largest religions in the world, and therefore they have the most influence. And second, they have some of the most insidious beliefs. Despite this video being about religion, it is applicable to any belief. Furthermore, I cannot emphasize this enough. This does not mean that I believe all people of the Abrahamic faith have these beliefs, just that it is more common for them to have them. I know some amazing people in all three of the Abrahamic religions who reject these beliefs, but there are many others not like them within these religions. Now let's start talking about belief and causation in the more general sense. Michael Shermer, in his book, The Believing Brain, explains how people come to believe things, and I quote, we form our beliefs for a variety of subjective, personal, emotional, and psychological reasons. In the context of environments created by family, friends, colleagues, culture, and society at large. After forming our beliefs, we then defend, justify, and rationalize them with a host of intellectual reasons, cogent arguments, and rational explanations. Beliefs come first, explanations for beliefs follow. I call this process belief-dependent realism, where our perceptions about reality are dependent on the beliefs that we hold about it. Reality exists independent of human minds, 
but our understanding of it depends upon the beliefs we hold at any given time. In Sherman's book, he has evidence supporting this quote, but I think that is beyond the scope of this video. This video is more about the effect belief has on our behavior than the cause of the belief itself. So I will skip this for now, but if there's enough interest, I will go into it. For now, let's talk about how belief affects our actions. What causes our behavior falls under the concept of causation, which is a hotly debated topic within both the social and natural sciences. Unfortunately, we do not fully understand it, and it becomes even more difficult to understand in relation to agents' behavior than when it comes to actions of items that do not have agency. Let's look at an example. Imagine a man named Mike. He shot a woman named Angela in the heart, killing her. There are two different causations to consider in this example. What caused Angela to die and what caused Mike to shoot Angela? In the case of Angela dying, it was the bullet penetrating her heart. We can get even more specific about her bleeding out or that her heart stopped pumping. However, it still is a much easier explanation to determine than when we consider why Mike shot Angela in the first place. Was it deterministic or his choice? Was it caused by his beliefs or some external force? If it was his beliefs, then was it a single belief or multiple? Why do other people with some of the same beliefs as Mike not do the same actions? Typical causal theories of action in relation to agents feature desires, intentions, and beliefs as causal factor. Going forward, I will refer to desires, intentions, and beliefs combined as thoughts. These theories are independent of the argument of free will. You can believe in a libertarian free will, compatibilism, or determinism, and thoughts may still be the reason for the action. But how thoughts cause action may be different based on your position on libertarian free will. Determinists may say thoughts are simply a chemical reaction in the brain causing your action, but libertarians might try to explain your thoughts of independent of chemistry. However, in both cases, mental states were still the causal entity. This idea of our thoughts controlling our actions can be traced back to at least as far as Aristotle. Aristotle said in the Nicomian Ethics, the origin of action it's efficient, not its final cause. It's choice. And that of choice is desire and reasoning with a view to an end. Aristotle here is stating that our actions are freely chosen, but choices, desires, and reasons are thoughts within our heads. In the context of free will, are they not? When you make a choice, are they not influenced by your beliefs? So even if beliefs were not the ultimate cause of action, they would still be the penultimate cause. In social psychology, they attribute behavior to either internal or external factors. They use distinctiveness and uh, consensus as the determining factors of where the causal nexus resides. But for our case, only consensus matters. The question of consensus is asking the question, do others behave similarly in this situation? I think an example will make this more clear. Imagine John has trouble with the office software at your job, but no one else does. In this case, we attribute the troubles with John, but if everyone has issues with the software, then the program is to blame. This may seem like there's a whole range of behavior that is explained entirely by external factors, but let's examine this a little more closely. Let's take a more extreme example. Imagine everyone in the office has a problem with the new employee because he is gay. Does this mean their belief has no causal factor and the explanation is completely in the external environment? Maybe in the prior case, the reason why everyone else did not have trouble with the software is because they were trained on it and John wasn't. In the latter case, maybe they have an internalized norm of bigotry. Does this mean that their thoughts don't matter simply because others think the same way? I don't think so. Internalized norms and knowledge are forms of belief. Similarly, in mainstream economics, rational choice theory tries to explain human behavior. In it, people are assumed to behave in a particular way, called rational, based on their preferences. If they do not behave in the way the model predicts, they are considered irrational. While preferences are not the same exact thing as belief, they are affected by belief. 
This is mostly agreed on in economics. Behavioral economists have tried and convicted cognitive biases for this irrational behavior. Mario Rizzo and Glenn Whitman list a number of these biases in their book, Escaping Paternalism, Rationality, Behavioral Economics, and Public Policy. While Rizzo and Whitman disagree that people are necessarily acting irrational, they agree preferences are at least one of the reasons for behavior. Then in international relations theory, Alexander Wendt, in his famous paper, Anarchy is What States Make of It, a fundamental principle of constructivist social theory is that people act toward objects, including other actors, on the basis of the meaning the objects have for them. States act differently toward enemies than they do toward friends, because enemies are threatening while friends are not. Here, the meanings objects have for actors are beliefs about those objects, regardless if the belief is objectively true or not. In both cases, the meaning of the objects altered their behavior. Wendt goes on to explain how collective identities lead to belief formation. On an individual level, when a Christian or Muslim believes that gay people go to hell, this causes them to act differently towards them. When a nationalist believes that his nation is superior, he treats people from other countries differently. Both David Hume and Adam Smith thought that belief, or as they called it, opinion, was what gave states their power. Paul Sager, in his great book, The Opinion of Mankind, details the political philosophy of Hume and Smith and how they had different views on how political authority exists. Sager says, yet in political theory, prior to the engagement of practical politics, as it happens to be given by the practice of the age, sovereignty is not a primary or useful category of political analysis from Hume's perspective, who is or is not thought to hold sovereignty in any given time and place is determined by opinion. And hence, it is the mechanisms of opinion that ought properly to occupy our philosophical attention. Being sensitive to the fact that these can and do change as human circumstances alter. Today, many people in North Korea believe that Kim Jong-un has the legitimate right of rule. In the past, many people believed in the divine right of kings. How is this any different than the opinion or belief of the government of the United States right to rule? Yes, in every case, the reasoning is different, but it is nothing more than their belief it is no more an objective fact than a king's right to rule by their lineage from Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, legitimacy and consent are a much larger topic. So again, I will need to go deeper into that in another video. Let's talk about things a little closer to home. Almost all of us generally take thoughts to be causal factors in action. When we try to convince someone to take a particular action, we are trying to change their thoughts in order to change their behavior. Advertising is designed to change our thoughts in a particular fashion in order to get people to carry out a particular action. Why do the skeptics in my audience debate with theists? And why do the libertarians or anarchists debate with people who support the state to varying levels? Because each group is trying to change the thoughts of their opponents in order to change their behavior. I think I have given a a good amount of evidence that our actions may be caused by our beliefs, but that is in the general case. How do we determine if any particular belief causes a particular act? Well, there are three characteristics necessary to determine causality. Covariation, temporal precedence, and the elimination of other possible causes. Covariation means the proposed cause and effect need to be present together. The necessity that the proposed cause must be prior to the event we are trying to explain is called temporal precedence. And finally, we need to eliminate any other possible causes. I can take this topic into so many other directions, but we have so little time. I can go deeper into belief and causality, talk about how the mind-body problem is relevant, or even discuss more about group identity, but this video is still already going to be quite long. So I will save those topics for later videos. Despite my argument, the belief causes action, I am not saying belief is the only reason for action. Now, before I discuss religious belief, I want to talk about one more topic, 
authority. Why are we talking about an authority in a video about belief? Because if we take Hume and Smith's word on it, then what is authority? Nothing more than mere belief or opinion. And I might add, the most dangerous belief. Many people may argue that authority is more than opinion, especially theists in relation to God or statists in relation to the state. I am not going to touch the later topic in this video, but in the next section, I will explain why I think the authority of God is nothing more than mere opinion. Why is authority so dangerous in my opinion? In the 1960s, Stanley Milgram, a Yale University psychologist, performed an experiment, today known as the Milgram experiment. During the experiment, subjects were asked to administer electric shocks to people who were taking a test if they got an answer wrong. They were told the experiment was trying to determine the effect punishment had on memory. Unbeknownst to them, the electric shocks were fake and the students were actors. Even though they believed they were administering harm, they continued to shock their victims at an increasing rate of intensity. Despite this being quite controversial when published, it has been mostly vindicated in the field of psychology since. They did as they to were told because they believed the researcher had some level of authority. Then in the 1970s, Philip Zimbardo administered another experiment, which had come to be known as the Stanford Prison Experiment. In this experiment, they split 70 students between being prisoners and prison guards. In order to test role-playing, labeling, and social expectations on behavior. The findings of the experiment are often called into question for not having a control group, among other reasons. However, the role of authority, I think, is quite clear. The students that were acting as prison guards were instructed to perform psychological torture on the student inmates. Despite the immorality of such action, they acted as they were told. In history, we see this quite often. Both the Nazi armed forces and the SS performed unthinkable acts in the name of Germany during the Holocaust because they were told to by their leaders. During the Jamestown Massacre, 900 people committed suicide by drinking cyanide-laced punch because their leader ordered them to. These are some of the many examples in history of people just following orders. Anytime someone says, we should do X because someone ordered it, they are appealing to authority. It is not only a fallacy, but a very dangerous one. Similarly, many people say that this is right or wrong because either the government or the religion says so. You hear it often in the form of the act is a sin because the Bible says so, or doing that is wrong because it is illegal, or the state or God can do that because of its authority. Without reasoned arguments for action, action will very often cause harm. This doesn't mean even with reasoned actions, no harm will be caused. Just the belief in authority increases the amount of harm. Without further ado, let's get to the main event. Before we get into this, I need to make this point one more time. I'm not saying all religious people are bad people or that they have harmful beliefs. I am saying that the more religious someone is, the more likely they are to have harmful beliefs. One more thing. Theism, just like atheism, is the answer to a single question. Do you believe in a God? The theists answer yes, and the atheists answer either I don't believe you or no. Neither position, by itself, can cause harm. However, there are many beliefs that are snuck in under religion that is often attached to theism that is harmful. Speaking of religion, there are three reasons I care about religious belief. First, there is a double standard. If a religious person puts up a billboard, goes door to door, or posts on Facebook trying to convince people to find God or join their religion, people generally do not care. If an atheist does any of the, those actions, he is often considered a bigot, even by many atheists. Second, 
there's a correlation between religious belief and bigotry. This means the more religious someone is, the more likely they are to be a bigot. Of course, this does not mean there is a causation, but I believe there is some level of causation. Finally, there's a correlation between religious belief and science denial. This also causes harm, either directly or indirectly. Let's start with the double standard. Now, I'm not saying that no atheists ever get mad at religious people for sharing their faith. Nor am I saying that all religious people get mad at atheists for questioning religion or faith. What I am saying is it is more, much more common for atheists who question religion to be called out for it than religious people are for trying to spread their religion. There are numerous cases where atheist billboards have been removed due to overwhelming religious complaints. William Ramsey, in his article, Bigotry and Religious Belief, he says, Attacks on religious doctrines are often characterized as a form of bigotry, and traditional analysis of the concept support this view. I argue that regarding such attacks as bigotry is inconsistent with a variety of contemporary moral attitudes and social goals. I offer an improved account of when we should ascribe bigotry, one that is more coherent with views on tolerance and their importance of open debate. Next, we have the correlation between religious belief and causation. Darren Sharkett, in his 2014 book, Changing Faith, the dynamics and consequences of America's shifting religious identities, argues that the most religious Americans are much more likely to support laws against interracial marriage than secular Americans are. He further reveals that 45% of Baptists and 38% of sectarian Protestants support these same laws. And while 26% of Baptists and 21% of conservative evangelicals say they would never vote for an African-American for president, less than 10% of secular people say the same. Even as an anarchist that wouldn't vote for a president at all, I think we can all agree this is not a good reason not to vote for someone. On the question of gay marriage, a Pew poll from 2014 shows that 94% of the people polled who strongly oppose gay marriage have strong beliefs in God. The last 6% who oppose gay marriage have either a weak belief in God or no belief at all. Some people will argue that there is either no causation here or that the causation is in the opposite direction, meaning that bigoted people try to use the scripture to try to support their bigotry instead of learning their bigotry from the scripture. Let's look at both statements. We have already established covariation. What about the temporal precedence? Another Pew poll shows that people that grew up in religious households are very likely to carry those same beliefs into adulthood. So much so that people that were raised exclusively by Protestants, almost 8 out of 10 still identify with their religion. As for Catholicism, it is a little lower at 6 out of 10 that still identify with their Catholic parents. While Pew doesn't have that data for any other Abrahamic religions, at least that I have found, I doubt they are largely different. This makes me think, maybe it is possible at one point in time, bigots flocked to a new group and cherry-picked scripture to support their bigotry. But as they pass it on to their children, they use scripture to support it now. Oftentimes, their religious leaders spread the hate as well. So there probably is, in most cases, temporal precedence. What in religion could be the cause? For starters, remember how dangerous the idea of authority is. In Romans 13.1, the Bible says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Many religious people say, if God commands it, they will do it. Sure, if God exists, then he being an omnipotent being, he can force compliance out of anyone. 
But how do we know that God exists? Believers would argue, often using their religious text or personal experience, but reject the religious text and personal experience of people in other re religious faiths. How do we know which religion is correct? They all cannot be correct, but they all can be wrong. John Loftus, an ex-Christian preacher, has defined a test for this, and I quote, The best and probably the only way to test one's adopted religious faith is from the perspective of an outsider with the same level of skepti skepticism one uses to evaluate other religious faiths. He calls it the outsider test for faith. Until people do this for their religion, I do not believe they have a justified reason for their belief. And since God, in the different religious sects, demands different acts, the harm that is caused by blind authority, and we cannot determine which religion is correct, then the proper response is to reject them all until we have better evidence. Where does the bigotry itself come from, though? All over the Bible. Let's list a few. In Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. In Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. In Nehemiah 13.23-30, they call interracial marriage a great evil. In Judges 12, 4 to 6, it details 40,000 people killed because of their accent. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Dan Barker, another ex Christian preacher, lists a ton more problems with the Bible in his book, God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. Yes, I only use the Old Testament, but the three Abrahamic religions all believe in the Old Testament. Muslims will say the Old Testament and the New was corrupted by man, but the Quran has similar passages to these in it. I know many Christians will also say, but that is the Old Testament. Jesus spoke of love only and overturned all the Mosaic law. There are two problems with that argument. First, as Barker points out in the same book, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. When asked if he was the Messiah, claiming that he is God himself. If he is the God of the Old Testament, then he is responsible for all the deplorable acts in it that are either attributed to or commanded by God. Second, nothing in the New Testament says what of the old law should still be followed and what should be abandoned. Most Christians still support the Ten Commandments. This is one reason the different sects of Christianity do not agree with one another. Anti-gay Christians often argue they are being loving with their bigotry. They do not want the gay person to go to hell, so they will not support the gay lifestyle. This is why they kick gay children out of their home, refuse to hire or provide a service for gay people, and support government sanctions against gay marriage. All to protect them from eternal torture. Well, as already detailed, we have no good reason to believe in a god but well, we can see the visible harm these acts cause on gay people. You tell me, should we try to reduce the harm we see or the harm we have no evidence for? Maybe bigots are cherry-picking the bigoted passages, or maybe the non-bigoted religious people are cherry-picking. Again, how do we know which passages take precedence? Okay, I think I have established support for covariation and temporal precedence. But can we rule out any other explanations? No, not really. There have been no controlled experiment nor a regression analysis to control for confounding of variables. That I know of, at least. But I think the evidence I have provided should be enough to at least bring the question into the light. I know I gave one more reason about why I care about people's religious belief, that there is a correlation between religious belief and someone being anti-science, Unfortunately, this video is already over 30 minutes long, so I will save that for another video. Sorry, this was a long one, and I was still not able to talk about all the topics I wanted to in order to fully address the question. I hope 
I have been able to at least make you think. At the very least, please be respectful. And if you think I missed anything or made an egregious error in reasoning, please tell me below in the comments. Next week's video, I'm going to start summarizing Chapter 2 in John Wolfe's book, Why I Became an Atheist. See you soon. Thank you everyone for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.